Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Hello and welcome to the class on anaerobic bacteria. At the end of the lesson, we all will be able to understand what are the non-spore forming anaerobic bacteria, the infections caused by them and the laboratory diagnosis stepwise approach by taking an example of a case. So, to meet the objectives of this class, we are consider and discuss the anaerobes under the following headings, infections caused by them the spectrum of infections, etiology of non-sporing anaerobic bacterial infections, the clinical clues what we are going to get for diagnosis, the treatment and the details of anaerobic bacteria, their general features, the classifications, virulence factors, pathogenesis etcetera and also the stepwise approach to the laboratory diagnosis. So, let us begin the class, we had a case 53 year old who approached us with the complaints of fever, headache, vomiting which was very gradually in onset and the patient was little concerned when he could not easily open his mouth which is called as trismus and slowly family members started noticing there was altered behavior of patient. The patient had dental pain for about more than 3 to 4 months ago and also as I said there was slight behavioral change in this patient that was presented as the slurred speech. So, these were some of the important findings what we noted down. On further examination his vitals were normal, the temperature, blood pressure and pulse were within normal limits. There was diminished vision and his motor reflexes were little weak or subnormal. However, the patient had the dental abscess which was notable in this case. There was no history of seizures, weakness of limbs, no discharges or chronic fever, trauma etcetera. Further we went ahead and did his brain MRI which showed the space occupying lesion. These were the supportive laboratory findings there was indication of a chronic infection as these investigations suggested. So, what do you think is a clinical diagnosis in this case? The patient had fever, he had headache, vomiting and altered sensorium in the form of altered speech, weak motor reflexes and also on examination diminished vision was noticed. MRI gave us a very important finding of space occupying lesion and supportive lab findings were also in favor of this diagnosis. Diagnosis is brain abscess in this case. Laboratory diagnosis is very important in such cases because we need to know what is the etiology that is microorganisms or the bacteria which are causing brain abscess which will help us further to initiate the prompt and the specific therapy. Hence, we proceeded with the laboratory diagnosis in this case. Surgical drainage of the abscess was done, the pus was collected in fluid thioglycolate broth and it was immediately promptly sent to the laboratory for further investigations. In the laboratory as we know there are various modalities of approach to lab diagnosis, the first step however microscopy, this we are going to do to look for any evidence of the bacteria in the pus. The pus was made into a smear on the slide, grease free slide and it was stained by gram stain. As we can see here there were gram negative short and delicate pleomorphic bacilli. We could see some of them a little longer, some of them short cocobacillary forms. This was the finding of gram stain 
from the pus. The pus was further subjected for bacterial culture for aerobic organisms as well as anaerobic organisms. As it is a case of brain abscess, the anaerobic organisms are quite important here. So, parallelly aerobic and anaerobic cultures were set up. At the end of 24 hours, we grew no aerobic organisms from this pus. However, at the end of 48 hours, we could grow Bacteroides fragilis. Further, this culture was subjected to antibiotic sensitivity and it was found to be resistant to penicillin. So, this was the quick laboratory report what I have given you in this case. The report was immediately sent to the physician so that he is able to initiate the prompt and specific therapy in this case. Same was done. Amoxicillin sulbactam was a treatment, uh, the drugs which were given to this patient along with metronidazole as it is the anaerobic uh, infection. Most of the times we expect the mixed infection in such cases. The patient was treated promptly and he recovered without any events. At the end of 10 days, he was sent back home. This was summary of the patient which we came across and we did an anaerobic aerobic workout. Now, taking the help of this case, we are going to discuss our class under the following headings as said earlier. We will consider what are anaerobic infections and what are the anaerobes, what are their detailed characteristics and how do we approach for the detailed laboratory diagnosis. So, now let us discuss some points related to anaerobic infections and the etiology of anaerobic infections. Brain abscess particularly as I gave the example here is a serious and life threatening infection. The incidence however has dropped in the previous decades because of advent of useful and very effective antibiotics which could really treat the patients very effectively. High degree of clinical suspicion however is very very important because it is going to help us to diagnose the case clinically, confirm it laboratory wise and start the specific and prompt therapy. The mean age of occurrence of brain abscess is between 24 to 57 years. However, it can occur at any age if there are some precipitating factors like trauma, malignancy and other factors. There is male preponderance which is usually noted. Both are susceptible male and female. However, male preponderance is particularly noted in brain abscess. Immunocompromised patients are more particularly prone to brain abscess. Coming to the etiology, we have to have the knowledge of the bacteria which are involved in causing brain abscess because it helps us to initiate the specific therapy. There are some aerobic and anaerobic bacteria. The aerobic bacteria are Streptococcus mileri, Pseudomonas, Staphylococci, Propionibacterium acnes, Klebsiella species and Mycobacterium tuberculosis if it is a chronic brain abscess. The important ones in such cases are anaerobic bacteria, especially the Bacteroides fragilis group which we isolated in our index case today. The combination of aerobic and anaerobic bacteria could be isolated in a single case and usually that is a picture which we come across. There could be association of Bacteroides fragilis with another bacterium that is Pepto Streptococcus or Peptococcus or the anaerobic bacteria could be associated with aerobic bacteria. There are however, some other fungi which will help us to keep the differential diagnosis in mind. Fungi which are usually involved in brain abscess are Aspergillus species, Candida species, Cryptococci and Nocardia species. Fungal brain abscesses are usually more prevalent in immunocompromised patients or patients who are with the malignancies or on long treatment of antibiotics. Now, we have considered some of the details of the brain abscess which is important. Now, let us consider what are those characters of anaerobes. The anaerobes, what are they? Anaerobes are the bacteria which can survive and exist without the presence of oxygen and some of them in fact are going to be killed when they are exposed to 0.03 percent of oxygen as little as that oxygen can usually kill them. This is how we can differentiate them and classify them as obligate anaerobes and facultative anaerobes. 
facultative anaerobes are the ones which are really okay with the presence of oxygen that means they can grow in presence of little oxygen they are not going to be killed. These bacteria were first discovered by Louis Pasteur in 1861 where are they present? They are all present on the body and inside the body in fact in very large numbers. The non-sporing anaerobes are going to usually outnumber aerobes in the ratio of 30 times to 1000 times. They are really present in large numbers in intestines. Small intestine harbors about 10 raised to the power 3 to 4 organisms per ml of uh, fluid as compared to the number of these organisms going to increase as we go towards the large intestine side where they are usually present in very large numbers they may range up to 10 raise to the power 10 to 11 and the ratio of anaerobes to aerobes is 1000 times to 1 aerobe. They are also present on the skin, they are present in the mouth, they are present in the genital urinary tract as well. That is why these organisms usually are responsible for endogenous. These organisms are usually going to have enzymes which will help them to survive in absence of oxygen. Why do we have to learn them? Anaerobes are important in health as well as disease. Let us not consider their importance in the health in today's class. On the other hand, they are very, very important in case of infections. Usually, these organisms are neglected because they are not easily grown. They can cause infection in any organs and systems. Usually, they cause the abdominal infections, oral infections and deep organ abscesses including brain abscess, mastoiditis. They can cause chronic pharyngitis ear, nose, throat infections, orodental infections, neck space infections, respiratory infections, lung abscesses, etc. They cause opportunistic infections because they take the upper hand whenever there is reduction in the immunity and they are usually mixed infections in nature. There are some precipitating factors and predisposing factors for the causation of anaerobic infections in the form of trauma especially trauma with lodgement of any foreign body will initiate the process of growth of these anaerobes because of compromised blood supply. Diabetes, malignancy and prolonged antibiotic therapy are few other reasons for support of anaerobic infections. We have studied the characters of anaerobes. Let us consider how are they classified. There are large number of many species of anaerobic bacteria they are for convenience has been classified according to the gram stain nature and basically depending upon whether they are spore forming or non spore forming. So, here the anaerobes are basically classified into non spore forming and spore forming anaerobic bacteria and the spore forming ones are beyond the purview of today's class. Let us consider the non sporing anaerobic bacteria. They are basically classified into cocci and bacilli and further classified into gram positive and negative and gram positive and negative bacilli. Let us take some examples under each class so that these are the ones which are important when we are considering the clinical infections. The gram positive ones the important species are peptococcus and peptostreptococcus species. Among the gram negative ones, Villonella. Coming to the bacilli, bacilli are very important and most common cause of non sporing anaerobic bacterial infections. The gram positive ones, important ones being the actinomycetes, arachnea, bifidobacterium, lactobacillus, propionibacterium, etc. And among the gram negative ones, the bacteroids, which is the very, very important and the most commonest cause of most of the non sporing anaerobic bacterial infections. Others being Privotella, Porphyromonas, Fusobacteria and Leptotrichia. In the earlier days, bacteroids, Privotella and Porphyromonas were all considered under one group because of their genetic analysis and the 
clinical spectrum of infections, the Privotilla and Porphyromonas have been separated from the Bacteroides group. As I said, they are the most important ones. This whole group of Bacteroides have been further considered under following headings. Bacteroides fragilis group, which is the most commonest one. This classification is based on their fermentation characteristics, they are uh, whether they are saccharolytic moderately saccharolytic or completely asaccharolytic. Fragilis group which is the saccharolytic one, examples being the index bacillus that is Bacteroides fragilis, uh, Ovatus, Theta iota micron. Privotella group the commonest one being Privotella melanogenica, Privotella oralis, Porphyromonas, Porphyromonas asaccharolytica and Porphyromonas gingivalis. This is the classification of anaerobic bacteria. Basically, we classify them based on the spore forming nature, morphologically either as cocci or bacilli and further by gram stain and we need to remember some of the examples in each group because each one group is going to be important in causation of certain group of clinical infections. After this, let us consider what are those spectrum of infections caused by the anaerobic bacteria. As I said, the gram positive cocci, peptococci and peptostreptococci are involved in causing pyogenic wound infections, purpural sepsis, especially the peptococcus, urinary tract infections, lung infections, brain abscesses, etc. Other uh, gram positive bacilli, Actinomyces propionobacterium, are also involved in skin and soft tissue infections. On the gram negative side, Villonella, they are the gram negative cocci, are also involved in the bloodstream infections. Coming to the gram negative non sporing anaerobic bacilli, which forms the major chunk of clinical infections. Bacteroides fragilis, it can cause intra abdominal, genital, soft tissue infections. The Porphyromonas privotella are basically involved in the oral and dental root canal infections. They can also cause bloodstream infections lung and liver abscesses. The fusobacteria which is another important group here can cause liver abscess, lung abscess, oral abscess and pleuropulmonary infections. The mobiluncus, mobiluncus we have heard this as Dordelin's bacillus in bacterial vaginosis along with Gardnerella group of organisms. It causes typical presence of typical clue cells. So, these are some of the important non spore forming anaerobic bacteria which we need to remember as we see here they are involved in many of the clinical infections. Unless we keep them in mind usually we send the sample only for aerobic culture and we usually do not grow these because most of them are strict or obligate anaerobes. We fail to grow them and they just go out of our mind in the treatment. Hence, patient may come with recurrence of infection or chronic non-healing type of infections unless we consider the presence of anaerobic bacteria in all these infections. What are the clinical clues? As I said, we need to keep them in mind whenever we are making clinical diagnosis and when we are send, sending the sample especially, send for anaerobic culture as well. What are those clues which will help us or provoke us to go for anaerobic culture are whenever clinically we are coming across foul smelling discharge, putrid odor, nauseating odor or the rotten egg odor, they are all suggestive of the presence of anaerobes. There could be presence of gas in the tissue. This usually happens in case of clostridial infections, pronounced cellulitis. There is fast spreading infection, close proximity to mucosal surfaces as we are seeing here because the organisms are all present endogenously here, they are involved in causation of some of the clinical conditions because they are, they are very much present in and around the mucosal surfaces. They take the upper hand because of the immunocompromised nature, chronic non-healing wounds. In, in spite of prolonged or failure of therapy, there could be continuing infection that could be probably due to the involvement of anaerobic bacteria. Negative on culture. These are all some of the clinical clues. Let us see how these bacteria are going to cause infection. The source as I said they are all endogenous 
they gain access they invade the tissue then they are going to take the upper hand especially whenever they are going to find some supportive factors like impaired circulation in case of tissue necrosis there is presence of inflammation inflammation is going to add up to the edema edema is going to in turn cause pressure on the vessels further to lead to compromised blood supply and that becomes a vicious cycle tissue necrosis edema compromised blood supply will ultimately lower the redox potential of surrounding tissue presence of foreign body can also clog tissues or the vessels further leading to impaired blood supply diabetes can also add up to the whole pathogenesis as we are seeing here reduced immunity more of pathogenicity what are those virulence factors the capsular polysaccharide which is very well studied inhibit the phagocytosis of these organisms it will also help them to attach to the epithelial surfaces they have pili both the capsular polysaccharide and pili are going to help them to go into the first step that is the attachment to the epithelial surfaces and then they enter into the tissues they also cause some toxins they lyse the tissues they may release some enzymes like hyaluronidase heparinase protease superoxide dismutase catalase peroxidase and immunoglobulin proteases these are all the virulence factors which are going to help them in establishing the infection along with this if there are presence of pre existing infections with the aerobic bacteria that is going to be like icing on the cake because the aerobic bacteria would have already set the stage by initiating the infection they will also help anaerobic bacteria because they are going to consume the existing oxygen present in the tissue and pave the way for existence of the anaerobic organisms so till now we have studied anaerobic infections in detail and also have seen some of the characters of anaerobic bacilli and cocci let us now move into laboratory diagnosis the laboratory diagnosis as i already said important to initiate the prompt and the specific therapy one more key factor we need to remember in anaerobic infection is collection collection of sample is the crucial point because when we collect the sample in a wrong way we may end up either not growing the anaerobes or we may grow some wrong organisms proper sample collection is a key any anaerobe isolated cannot be tagged to the etiology of that particular condition because we might have just collected anaerobe which is present in the surrounding tissues they might have just grown as a bystander that is why when we grow anaerobe we cannot directly link it to the etiological factors unless our collection is proper the collection has to be done after properly cleansing area with a antiseptic and usually we advise not to use the swab because which is exposed to air and the obligate anaerobes especially may not survive there for a long time that is why we suggest to aspirate the fluid if it is a close abscess or if it is a deep wound collection of the tissues rather than going for swabs there are different methods for collection of different anaerobic samples some of the samples are not at all suitable like the sputum when we are suspecting the lung abscess or anaerobic pneumonia etc they are sputum is not suitable because it is a sample which is coming out passing all the mucosal surface plus it is the uh, sample which is already exposed to air so in any closed abscesses we suggest the needle and syringe aspiration as i just now described in female genital tract infections caldocentesis low respiratory tract infection we have to go for percutaneous transtracheal aspiration direct lung puncture etc pleural cavity thoracocentesis the sample should be again collected in a proper container and prompt transport however is also equally important tissue when we are collecting it has to be through surgical excision and urinary 
um, samples should be collected by bladder respiration. Once we collect the sample properly, that is not the end of the procedure. The transport of specimen to the laboratory is equally important. In unavoidable circumstances, sometimes we collect the sample on the swab. The swab should be then inserted immediately into some of the transport media like Stuart media, fluid thiagulicolate medium. This medium is particularly very useful. This has got upper part which is usually oxidized material, the swab should be inserted into the medium in such a way that material is kept deep into reduced part of this medium. This is a semi solid medium and most commonly used in the laboratories. This medium is also going to help us as the growth medium as well as the transport medium. Similarly, another important medium is the Robertson's cooked meat medium. This can also act as a growth medium as well as transport medium. The swab can be either inserted into one of these media into the reduced part and immediately sent to the laboratory for further processing. When we have aspirated pus, we can put the pus into gassed out vials containing carbon dioxide or nitrogen replacement. They can be further put in the bio bags or there are some pre-reduced PRAS media, pre-reduced anaerobically sterile media. The pus can be inserted into such media. When we have collected the sample in a syringe and needle, air should be expelled out the remaining air and it should be immediately inserted into the rubber stopper and sent to the laboratory. Blood when collected, it should be collected in the brain heart infusion broth or you can put some part of the blood into the fluid thioglycolate medium. Unless we take all these precautions, sample is going to be naturally rejected because by the time sometimes we receive improperly collected samples, they are already exposed to air and there is no point in further carrying out culture and they may be rejected. After sample collection and transport, the sample is in the laboratory, then we are going to subject it first to the microscopy. Microscopy is very important and it forms the level 1 identification of anaerobes. Sample will be smeared onto a glass slide and stained by gram stain and there are particularly some gram stain modifications which are suggested for staining anaerobic bacteria. The gram stain we may sometimes see polymicrobial organisms that means there could be gram positives, gram negatives, cocci and bacilli. As I said this is the finding probably due to the mixed infections. The organisms could be delicate having pointed ends, they may be pleomorphic, they may be capsulated as we see in case of Bacteroides fragilis, very tiny organisms, cocobacillary forms, little longer forms, irregular staining and sometimes vacuolization. They indicate the presence of non-spore forming anaerobic bacteria. So, the microscopy is really going to add up to the diagnosis. Coming to culture, culture is also very important here, though culture is not easy. However, it has to be done very carefully and the identification should also be done very skillfully. We have two sets of media, non-selective media and selective media. Non-selective media should be used whenever we are growing the organisms from the sterile sites. Example is the supplemented blood agars going to have neomycin, hemin and vitamin K. Among the selective media, canamycin, vancomycin laked blood agar commonly called as KVLB. We have Bacteroides bile esculin agar BBA and phenyl ethyl alcohol agar. This is a plate you are seeing is the Bacteroides bile esculin agar. We are seeing the dark colored Bacteroides fragilis organism because this organism is going to produce esculin. It is going to hydrolyze esculin. Once we have selected the media for inoculation, they should be put into the anaerobic atmosphere. There are different systems which we can use for incubating these plates. There is gas pack which is readily available and ready made sachet are available for creating the anaerobiasis inside the gas pack. They need to be opened, added with water and put inside along with the culture plates. 
so that it creates the anaerobic atmosphere. We can use some of the indicators to just check whether the anaerob anaerobic atmosphere is maintained inside the jar. The best one could be Macintosh Fields jar. This jar can be connected to various gas sources like nitrogen, hydrogen etc. More recent methods are the anaerobic glove box which is connected to gas cylinders. So, once we have inoculated the plates, we have to keep them for minimum of 48 to 72 hours at 37 degrees centigrade for the bacteria to grow. Non-sporing anaerobes, especially the fusobacteria are slow growers. They may grow after 72 hours. So, it is better to wait for another one or two days for the fusobacteria to grow. Rest of them will grow in 48 to 72 hours. So, once we have grown them, it is important to carry out aero tolerance testing because the facultative aerobes will grow inside chambers. So, it is important that we differentiate aerobe, facultative anaerobe, obligate anaerobe. Aero tolerance testing will help. We can do the identification by carrying out some of the preliminary tests like gram staining, morphology, pigmentation. Here in this plate, we can see the dark pigmented organisms, brownish organisms, Prevotella. Right. So, we are going to examine the plates for all these characters like pigmentation, presence of fluorescence. Fluorescence is one character when some of the organisms like Porphyria monas, when they grow on the plates or when they are present in any clinical sample, the dressings or the culture plates when they are exposed to UV light, they show the brick red fluorescence. Pitting of agar is noted sometimes, motility, indole and catalase will also help. So, level 1 identification of the organisms can be done based on gram staining, pigmentation, fluorescence, pitting, motility, indole and catalase reactions. Some of the organisms will produce the either saccharolytic or proteolytic change in Robertson's cooked meat medium. This finding can also be kept in mind. So, level 1 identification is easy without any much of a resources. Level 2 identification before we go for this, we have to confirm the organism as the obligate anaerobe or facultative anaerobe. Once we have done that, level 2 identification is further done based on sugar fermentation capabilities of the organisms, bile resistance, esculine hydrolysis and also further we can use some of the identification discs. The discs which are used for identification are gentamicin 10 micrograms. Many of the non-spore forming anaerobes are resistant to gentamicin. Metronidazole is important disc which will help us to say whether they are anaerobes. Sometimes even when we do the primary inoculation of the plates, these discs can be applied at the secondary or primary streaking level, so that we can isolate as well as come to know whether we are dealing with anaerobic organisms. Many of anaerobes are sensitive to metronidazole. Canamycin, vancomycin, cholestin are some of the identification discs which will help us to further differentiate to the species level. So, level 2 identification is a step next to level 1 identification which has helped us to go up to the species level. Level 3 and level 4 identifications wherein we are going to use some of the automated systems or the detailed workup of biochemical characters so that they will help us in definite identification of these uh, organisms. Many of the laboratories may not be furnished with all of them. In such cases, presumptive identification is going to suffice for the treatment purpose. However, what is more important here is the Antibiotic sensitivity testing is important in certain conditions which are highly fatal or serious infections. As we had the example in case of brain abscess, the time was important, the organism was resistant to penicillin which helped us to go for alternative treatment. Otherwise, most of the time the anaerobes sensitivity is mostly predictive. So, we need not go for detailed testing of all the isolates for antibiotics. As I said, it is indicated only in the fatal and severe anaerobic infections. 
The methods which are suggested by CLSI are agar dilution method, micro broth dilution method. Sometimes the disc diffusion method can also suffice if it is a facultative anaerobe. Coming to the treatment of anaerobic infections, usually surgical treatment has to be supported along with the drug therapy. Metronidazole is a drug of choice, penicillin resistance and clindamycin resistance has come up nowadays. So, penicillin need to be used only after testing. Otherwise, if the organism is found to be resistant, we can go for amox sulbactam combination or piperacillin tazobactam combination. Clindamycin can be used. Usually, the organisms are sensitive to clindamycin. Chloramphenicol and the carbapenems can also be suggested. What is more important is the surgical debridement which will help in fast recovery. I think with this we have considered a case here and discussed the anaerobic bacteria under all these following headings and I hope we have achieved the lesson objective that we have learnt in detail about the anaerobic bacteria, the infections caused and laboratory diagnosis. These are some of references for the pictures used in this class. Thank you very much.